Hello everyone, this is Fabric Academy 2019, uh, week uh, number 10, wearables with Liza Stark from uh, New York, directly connected with us. Hello Liza, nice Hello. to see you again. Uh, I will let you uh, show your screen and start the class. Okay, here we go. Uh, give me one moment. Okay, how's that? Can everybody see? Is my screen up? Yes. Yes? Okay, wonderful. All right, here we go. So, um, so this week we're going to talk about wearables and e-textiles. And um, just to give you an overview of the big topics we'll cover, we'll discuss actuators, different applications of wearable technology sort of sprinkled throughout. We're going to talk about a small microchip called the ATtiny. Uh, and then we'll talk about embedded electronics and different interfaces. So a more in-depth sort of agenda is here. We'll go through these different actuators, so we'll kind of group them into visual actuators, um, actuators being things that do something, uh, sound, motion, and then we'll talk about ATtiny, um, again, this microchip, about how to program it, and different sort of um, circuits that you can make out of it that you can uh, sort of uh, repurpose for your own projects. Um, and we'll stop along the way at different points for y'all to ask questions if you have any. This is going to be a lot of information. Um, I've tried to structure the slides so you can go back and find um, information about the different topics that you're interested in, but it's really meant to give you more of a, of a wide breadth and introduction as opposed to go really in depth. But uh, that being said, we do try, I do try and get um, as detailed as possible in the given time. So let's get started with um, just sort of a brief introduction around what, and some considerations around what wearable means. Um, so just to sort of kick off with um, the question of why we wear things, right? To always keep that in mind because, you know, just because we see blinky LEDs that we think look pretty, um, it's, it, that shouldn't be enough always to just stick it on a garment. Um, we want to think about uh, ways that we can use technology to really enhance enhance the body. So, you know, we wear to express ourselves, um, we wear to communicate things to other people, and we wear to protect ourselves and protect things around us. Um, a lot of uh, the world of fashion tech and wearable technology, you'll often hear the word second skins. Um, so this idea that technology can augment our body in different ways, um, ways that will allow us to increase our sensing capabilities so we can collect new data about our bodies, um, about our bodies or our environments, um, and that we can create new opportunities for reaction and interaction on the body. So there are a lot of different um, spaces and opportunities to sort of employ technology uh, on the body that we'll get into. So this is a slide that I highly recommend that you come back to every time you start a new wearable project. Um, these are some, these are about six considerations that you always need to account for whenever you're starting uh, a new, a new piece. So first is the, um, the application. So think about, is this proof of concept or is it going to be runway or is it going to be sort of like an everyday product? Based on the application of what you're designing for, um, you will need to have different levels of fidelity. So if this is just a proof of concept, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't even maybe necessarily have to be fully functioning. Um, but if it's an everyday product, it has to be uh, really durable and it has to be uh, functioning for people to use it and has to be safe for people to use it as well. So that will require more testing uh, and uh, probably a little bit more time and development. So the next is durability. So again, thinking about is it every day? Does it need to be worn daily or is it for a single event? Um, like, you know, is it, for example, something that would achieve a Fitbit status that you are putting on your body all the time? Um, it's probably on a part of the body that would get a lot of wear and tear. Or is it just for some, like, you know, a dress for a gala, for example, um, or a costume for a show? 
it's also important to consider, again, if it's uh, meant to be worn every day or if it's like a proof of concept, maybe it's just worn on a mannequin and you can sort of uh, get around some of the challenges of placement um, just by using straight pins. And if it's a demo, perhaps it doesn't even need to go on a mannequin. Uh, next is wearability. So of course, we're talking about garments. So you wanna think about how it should feel. Um, if you, you know, for example, have a huge battery, thinking about where that would live, you don't necessarily want to place it uh, somewhere where somebody would sit down because not only would that be uncomfortable, it might not be super safe. Um, so you want to think about the different textiles that would be appropriate for it um, and then the, the placement of the electronics. Perhaps you need, you don't want to put the electronics directly on the front of the fabric, but you want to add a base layer to it so you can put the actual um, visible fabrics over top of it. Washability is also a really big consideration, especially if it's supposed to be used more often than not and maybe in more rigorous situations. So perhaps if you need to make it washable, then the board needs to be removable. And there are different ways that you can do this through snaps and various types of connectors. Uh, next is the, the, the bane of every sort of wearable technology, fashion technology, e-textile designer, power. Um, so if you have electronics on the body, it has to be powered in some way. Batteries tend to be big and bulky, um, so you need to consider how long it needs to be powered for, um, how long people will be able to actually wear it, um, and if it needs to be, if the power source needs to be easily reachable on the body, you know, maybe you don't want to put it in the center of your back so you can switch out batteries or recharge. Or again, if it's just, if you've decided that it's only going to serve as a proof of concept, then maybe you can use wall power and you don't even have to worry about a battery. Uh, and then the final one is the circuit layout. So you want to you want to always have your textiles and your technology in conversation with each other. A lot of times you'll, if you know, I've seen collaborations between fashion designers and technologists who one always feels like, you know, either the garment design should win out or the, the technology, like the placement of the technology should win out. And really they have to be in conversation with each other. It's not about one winning out over the other. And this is the most uh, visibly manifested in the circuit layout. So where are you going to actually place the technology on the body? Where is the microcontroller going to be if you have a microcontroller? Um, where are the components going to be? Do you want them to be visible or do you want them to be hidden? Um, so again, as you are starting a new project, these are things that you want to consider as you're moving along your design process. Okay, so now let's dive into what is an actuator and different types of actuators that you can use. Just move this down a little bit. Um, okay, so an actuator is a component of a circuit, so just a part of a circuit that moves or controls another part of a circuit based on input. So here are three different types of actuators. These are the actuators that we'll normally see um, in different sort of DIY uh, projects or you know, fashion tech or just regular physical computing projects. Uh, and in the world around us. So LEDs, uh, motors, and speakers. These are all examples of actuators, so things that do things. Um, so when we talk about actuators, actuators have different state changes. So if you are working with something visu visual, you may have LEDs or here in this image fiber optics that turn on and off. Um, again, sound, perhaps it's you know, you have different volumes. You have, again, this binary state of on and off. Same with motion. So when we talk about actuators, actuators will go through state changes based on the input that they're receiving, either through your program or through a sensor or switch. Um, again, I, I already said this, but just to reiterate, there's a lot of information, so it's more of a repository that you can use as you come uh, to, back to do your assignment. So let's start with visual. Um, so I'm gonna talk about four different approaches that you can use or four different ways of thinking through adding a visual component to your wearable piece. So the first is LEDs and then NeoPixels, which uh, is a type of LED, it's, it's an LED, it's just programmable in a different way. Fiber optics and then thermochromic ink. So first we'll start with LEDs. We discussed this a little bit in the last class, but in the last e-textile class, but I just want to review what an LED is. So it's a light emitting diode, diode meaning electricity can only go in one direction. 
A consideration that you always want to be aware of with an LED is its viewing angle. So that's sort of the angle at which light is going to be dispersed through the cap. So you can have an LED with a very narrow viewing angle that basically just looks like a little piece of, uh, like a little circle of color when you look at it straight on, or you can have a wide viewing angle and you get a much broader range of light. In general, I would shoot for uh, wider viewing angles. You can get LEDs in different sizes. You can get them very small as a surface mount LED, or you can get them quite large, these really nice sort of 10 millimeter bulbs that are about this big. Um, you can get them in various colors, and you can even get LEDs that are RGB or red, green, blue LEDs that you can uh, mix those values to get all the colors of the rainbow. Um, as I said before, so they come in all different sizes, uh, and they come in different colors and plastic casings. So you'll see the, again, I mentioned the 10 millimeter LED versus the standard 5 millimeter or the smaller 3 millimeter. Um, Here's an example uh, of a narrow viewing angle, that orange LED at the bottom. Uh, and then you can also get different plastic casings that are either diffused or clear. Uh, I highly, highly, highly recommend getting diffused LEDs. Um, you always, when you're talking about LEDs, want to think through how to create nice diffusion because that's what really uh, lends the aesthetics to the LEDs. RGB LEDs, as I mentioned, um, so you can combine the, the leads to get three different colors. You want to be aware of whether or not you are getting a common cathode LED or a common uh, ground LED or a common anode or common power LED. So as you can see, there are three different legs, one for red, one for green, one for blue, which basically function as separate LEDs, right? If you were to um, hook this LED up to an Arduino, for example, you would need to have red, green, and blue all on separate pins. And then in the case of a common cathode, um, uh, connect that pin to ground. Or if it's a common anode, you would want to connect that other pin to power. Uh, surface mount LEDs, you can also get these in all, um, all different colors and sizes. I'll show you some examples of what you can do with these uh, in a moment. Uh, I really like, if I'm working on a wearable piece, I really like surface mount LEDs just because they are pretty discreet and they, you can still get a lot of light out of them. Um, there are uh, different levels of frustration that you may encounter upon soldering surface mount LEDs, but a tip for soldering them, and again, soldering, if you haven't tried it just yet, is a way of sort of metallically gluing a component to a board or to another component using a soldering iron, a really hot soldering iron. So um, the best way to work to, soft, to solder surface mount LEDs is to use tweezers um, and put some solder on one pad because we don't have legs on surface mounts. We have pads, put uh, some solder on one pad, hold it with a tweezer, make sure you solder it onto the board or onto another um, component. Once you have that in place, then you can uh, solder the other pad. So it may take a little bit of trying, but once you get it down, it's, um, it's, uh, it's very satisfying. Um, so there are different ways of making LEDs sewable. Um, some LEDs come already uh, soldered onto these little breakout boards that make them sewable, like the lily pad LEDs, um, or the lily pad micro LEDs, or the Adafruit sequins. Um, these LEDs already have a current limiting resistor on it. Uh, which you can see in the lily pad LED, sort of that little black component next to the LED. This can um, reduce the amount of brightness, because that's what it's supposed to do, on the LED. So in that case, if you want your LED is a little brighter, if you want to be able to control, um, control that, then you can look into more DIY solutions, like the DIY sewable LEDs with the um, conductive thread. Uh, and then you can choose the value of the resistor as if it's already having it there for you. You can also get uh, lily pad RGB LEDs to connect to, um, and the, um, the NeoPixels, as we'll see in a second, or you can take um, through hole LEDs and make them sewable and connect them that way. So just an example of some different projects that use LEDs as their main actuator. Um, so the climate dress is a, a pretty timeless example by Diffuse Design that uh, takes in climate data and then visualizes that on a dress. Very appropriate, uh, you know, right now. Um, Hussein Chalian uh, worked with Swarovski to develop uh, an LED dress. Um, there's also the Katy Perry dress that 
came afterwards that uh, got a lot of press and a lot of traction. Um, and then there is this other project uh, that uses LEDs and visualizes uh, and communicates um, different messages uh, by Kern Kalamo. Uh, so when you're working with LEDs, um, if you are using an Arduino, you always want to make sure that you are connecting your LED via a resistor. And when you do this, you're going to want to connect, um, connect it through a 220 ohm resistor. The reason that we need to do this is because LEDs, uh, basically each Arduino pin puts out more voltage than the LEDs can take. So we run the risk of damaging our LEDs if we don't connect them through an Arduino, uh, through the, this resistor. Um, you can also connect multiple LEDs to one pin uh, in parallel. Remember we talked about parallel last time, but if you do this, you really only want to connect about three LEDs. You want, don't want to connect like a whole like 100 LEDs in parallel. If you want to do that, we can use another component that we'll discuss in a bit. Okay, so that's LEDs. Now we'll move on to NeoPixels, which is Adafruit's, um, basically like Adafruit's version of a programmable LED. Um, so NeoPixels are RGB LEDs that have these drivers embedded uh, within, like a chip embedded in the LED. And so it makes them addressable. So versus this problem that we have if we want many, many, many LEDs and we want to control all of them differently, uh, but all of them at once, we would need to you know, connect each LED to one individual pin. And that takes up a lot of real estate on our board, real estate that we might want to use for sensors or for some other type of actuator, or maybe we just want to have a small package and we don't want to have to have like many, like, you know, dozens of different circuit traces going from a board to all of these individual LEDs. Uh, in this case, this is where the NeoPixels really shine because uh, you only need three traces and you can connect NeoPixels together and you can address them through software individually. Um, and so it, it's, it's really helpful to be able to do this instead of having to, to deal with all that hardware and sewing. Um, the only thing about NeoPixels that you need to remember is in order to use them, you have to use a microcontroller. You cannot just plug in with a battery. You have to connect them and, and write the software to program them. So just a different uh, smattering of packages that the NeoPixels come in. You can get NeoPixel strips and you can get them uh, with the LEDs at different widths. The nice thing about these is that you can, they have cut lines. So if you only want to use, you know, five, you can cut five off of the strip. If you want to use 105, um, you can do that as well. You can also get NeoPixel rings. You can get NeoPixel matrices. You can get sewable NeoPixels. Um, you can also just get the regular NeoPixels without any sort of breakout. Um, and when I say breakout, I basically mean um, a board that a component is uh, soldered onto that just makes it easily, more easy to, easy to, con to connect um, to other components or to another board. So you can get NeoPixels without any sort of breakout board underneath. Um, so just to give you an idea of how you might connect, uh, connect NeoPixels to uh, an Arduino or a Flora, so a Flora is um, Adafruit's sewable electronics board that they developed. I really like the Flora um, just because it gives you a lot of different grounds and it has bigger, uh, bigger holes that you can sew through. Um, so you only really have three pins that you need to connect to, that you need to connect the NeoPixels to, ground, uh, signal, and then the power. Um, so one thing that you want to do, so uh, NeoPixels can take up a lot of power. Um, you, when you're thinking about what your, how many pixels you want to have, you need to do some, you need to do some, a little bit of math, a little bit of calculating to figure out how much power you're actually going to need. Um, and this is all, um, if you really want to get more in depth on this, uh, Adafruit has a ton of different tutorials on how to work with NeoPixels. Um, this is just a very basic introduction, but um, you can use a LiPo battery, uh, which is great, uh, lithium polymer battery, which is really nice because you can recharge it. Uh, they tend to be smaller and a little bit thinner, so they're great for wearable projects. Um, 
or you can use a wall power supply again if you don't need to be moving around so much if you're just putting on a demo for example um, but the one thing that you you know you do want to remember is that neopixels need about 60 milliamps just for full brightness so this is a little bit more than what we see um, regular leds needing um, uh, 20 milliamps, for example, but we usually don't need full brightness, um, so we can just calculate our power needs by saying maybe we have, you know, 10 pixels that need 40 milliamps, and we divide that by a thousand, and that gives us the number of amps we need. We can use that to determine if we want to use a LiPo battery or the wall power supply. Uh, again, you can, you know, figure this out if you decide to use NeoPixels. There are more guided examples on Adafruit's uh, learning management system. Um, so if you are using a lot of NeoPixels, you may need to use an external power source. And we are actually going to, this is sort of maybe a theme of, uh, from a component perspective or a power perspective, a theme of this particular class is how to, um, how to use external power sources. Um, so sometimes you may need to power the microcontroller with one power source, but then your, your actuators need so much power that you need a second power source. So this is where we first encounter it, this. So if you have many, many, many NeoPixels, you may not be able to power them all through the current that the Arduino can put out, the voltage and current that the Arduino can put out. So you can add an external power source, um, either from a 9-volt battery, from a power supply, or uh, from the LiPo batteries. And if you do this, then it's best practice to put a capacitor um, across the power and ground lines to prevent any sort of uh, damage that would occur through a power surge to the strip. And then you want to put a 300 to 500 ohm resistor between um, the power and the Arduino. Um, one thing that uh, you need to remember if you are using NeoPixels, Adafruit has a particular library that they um, that you can use to program or that you must use to program the NeoPixels with unless you want to write your own library. They have a bunch of different examples that once you download, you can um, go into and modify. And I even found this like really lovely code generator uh, for NeoPixels where you basically pick how many NeoPixels you want to light up and then the behavior that you want, and then it'll sort of spit out code for you. Um, so a few projects with NeoPixels. Um, Becky Stern, who was the wearables lead at Adafruit, has a ton of different projects using NeoPixels like this uh, tiara. Um, Kobacon did a really nice sort of just series of prototypes around machine sewn NeoPixels where they would cut them into individual pieces and sort of create really nice aesthetic traces. Um, again, there's uh, this breathing vest by Kobacon and then uh, Pac-Man suspenders that Becky made too. So there, there are a fair amount of different projects that you can get inspired by using NeoPixels. They're a really nice little tool. Uh, okay, next, fiber optics. So fiber optics uh, are really great if you want, if you want to have a few LEDs and you sort of want to have light, light strands of sorts. It's a very different aesthetic. Um, and so if we think about how fiber optics work, um, basically you have this. Um, you have this long fiber uh, that uh, when you shine light in one end of it, it goes down the strand and emerges at the other end. That's basically it. Um, and so within this fiber, there's this clear core uh, and then an external coat that's called cladding. So based on the, the quality of the fiber and the type of, and like the thickness of the cladding, uh, that is what is going to determine um, how bright uh, how bright the fiber optic is um, and whether or not you can see it visibly from the sides, which we'll get into in a second. Um, so there are a few variables that you want to think through as you're considering working with fiber optics. So one is the light intensity uh, and the next is the type of fiber. So you, if you're working with fiber optics, you're really probably going to work with high watt LEDs, which will give you um, a much brighter, um, brighter uh, output than just a regular LED. NeoPixels work well with this, and, and again, um, uh, LEDs with a narrow viewing angle. This is where a narrow viewing angle, remember we talked about that with regular LEDs earlier. This is where that really comes in handy as opposed to a wide, because that light gets focused, um, and then high watt LEDs. 
the type of fiber is also super important uh, depending on what you're trying to achieve with your project, what your what aesthetics and visuals. Um, so you can have either end emitting fibers or you can have side emitting fibers. Uh, end emitting fibers is probably you've probably seen sort of when you go to like carnivals or like festivals, people waving around lights, uh, like light tools with flashlights that have these fibers at the end of it. Um, and you can generally with these only see these little like pin needles of light that come out the end of the fiber, right? So end emitting. Um, so they're usually quite thin. Uh, so just like properties about them. So they're usually very thin and grouped into really big bunches. Um, the cladding, remember that external layer that we talked about before, really keeps all of the light signals in. So none of the light can escape from the side. And then you get really bright points at the end. Uh, side emitting is a little different. They're usually a little bit thicker um, and more flexible. You can sort of uh, move them around in different ways and embed them uh, in more organic shapes. The cladding is not as dense, so it lets some light out of the sides. Uh, and a little bit of light comes out of the end. The light will tend to degrade over time, so it will be very bright uh, closer to the LED, makes sense, and not as bright towards the end. Uh, but you do get more of a uniform glow from the sides. Um, there are different ways. So, so one of the biggest challenges um, of thinking through using fiber optics is how to connect the LED to the fiber, right? You have these fibers and then you have an LED and you have to have them in as close contact as possible. And in fact, um, uh, Kobacan along with Moran uh, have been working on a project called the Lulu, um, which is basically thinking through and developing a product um, that will have a breakout connector that you can attach an LED to fiber optics. Uh, you can see the documentation um, there, there's a link to the documentation here. Um, so different, uh, different solutions that some people have come up with, um, drilling a hole in the LED, and then basically just putting the, the fiber optics directly into that hole. Again, this would, you know, this, you have to be very, very careful and very delicate with the LED, um, but seems to get, uh, to achieve good results. Um, just getting tubing and glue or using, uh, I've had actually some really good success with a 3D imprinted closure and glue as well. Um, so the main principle and takeaway here, get the fibers as close to the LED as possible and make sure that, um, that at the very base, that light is contained. You want to prevent the light from escaping in any possible direction uh, or way outside of those fiber optics. Um, uh, a few right, a few tips. Um, so if you try heat shrink, which is a way of just you know containing um, that light, you don't want to melt the fibers, which can happen if you're using um, a flame instead of a heat gun, or if you put a heat gun on it for too long. Um, here you can see some different examples of um, a Cobacomp project called Fiber Optic Poetry and different test connectors that they made. Um, hot glue and crazy glue are not great options for attaching the fibers, hot glue can melt uh, and crazy glue can make them disintegrate because of the chemicals inside of the glue. Um, E6000 is a good adhesive option, um, but you know, sort of weigh that with uh, you know, smells and, and environmental concerns and all of that. Um, and if you wanna actually cut the fibers, make sure you use a very, very, very sharp blade. So a few different projects. Um, and you know, working with fiber opt optics, while it can be tricky, it can just get these beautiful, beautiful results. Um, so the Lucette by Moran, this table runner that has, um, he and uh, Audrey, um, I don't know why I'm blanking on her last name at the moment, uh, but you can see, uh, have done a lot of amazing um, weaving experiments with these fiber optics that just generate incredible uh, outputs and then they program them into different behaviors. So you get these really lovely, like animated behaviors. Uh, Zach Posen put out a fiber optic dress for Claire Danes for the Met Gala a few years back that got a lot of, a lot of traction and was quite beautiful. Um, and then here are just two other examples, uh, another project by Koba Kant using uh, the Lulu. And then also when I found on Instructables, a fiber optic dress by a woman named Natalina. Okay, so now we're going to move into uh, Audrey Brio. That is Marron's, uh, one of his collaborators that uh, he was working with on Louis set. I remember her last name. Uh, moving on to thermochromic ink. So 
this is the last example that we'll talk about for visuals. So I want to show you two videos just to give you an example, just to, so you get an idea of how this works if you've never um, seen thermochromic ink before. Let's see if I can make this play without switching the slides. Uh, there we go. Okay, so we'll stop that. Uh, this is a circuit that uses a 9 volt battery, you can see right here. And this heating element made out of stainless steel conductive thread measures a resistance of 12.7 ohms. Um, just keep that in mind, it'll come into play in a little bit as we talk about how to make heating elements and power sources. Oops. And let's just try this one. Now this uses a LiPo battery that is 3.7 volts and probably about 1500 milliamp hours. And the heating element has a resistance of, excuse me, 2.6 ohms. Okay, so thermochromic inks are pigments that change state in the presence of heat. You can also get hydrochromic inks that change state in the presence of water. There are many different pigments that you can get um, uh, that will change, uh, that will uh, experience a state change based on changes in the environment. So um, if you're interested in this there, you should, you know, take a, a fun internet black hole deep dive into the different types of of um, pigments that are available. Um, but for thermochromic inks, so once they reach a certain temperature, uh, the inks become colorless. So the pigment disappears. It doesn't turn to white, uh, it just becomes colorless. Um, but you can mix pigments with different substrates, which is why I, um, I usually advocate for getting pigments because it's you can mix them in different, um, you can mix them with things like paint, glue, polymorph, uh, and you can also mix them in different densities, so in different um, uh, uh, different measurements, different quantities, to, to, to play around with those variables. So you can get thermochromic pigments from SparkFun in the States. You can also get them from Adafruit, uh, and you can get them from SFCX uh, in Europe. And uh, let's see, so yeah, SparkFun. So it's important to keep in mind what temperature the state change happens. So the spark fun pigment uh, changes at about 92 degrees Fahrenheit, 33 degrees Celsius. Um, the ones from Adafruit, I don't have up here, but they change at about 90, 89 or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so it's like fairly comparable. But the SFCX, they turn at 80 degrees Fahrenheit and 27 degrees Celsius. So this is, again, um, as you're thinking about your ambient environment and what you're trying to achieve and how quickly, uh, the, the turning temperature is important. Um, so it's also, you should remember that uh, even though we're going to talk about controlling thermochromic pigment with an Arduino and a heating element, that is not required to make a state change for thermochromic ink. Um, you can also change colors by using the heat of your body uh, or by using a hair dryer. Anything that generates heat will um, cause a change in this pigment but we're specifically gonna talk about how to do this with an Arduino and a heating element. So there are a few different variables that you wanna consider when you're working with thermochromic. So first is the amount of pigment that you use. And I highly encourage you to, you know, uh, 
play around with these variables, especially pigment base and substrate. Uh, play around with them, make many different swatches, and don't forget to record the quantities, sort of like the recipe that you use for each swatch um, to get a sense of what you want to accomplish for a particular project. So the amount of pigment is the first variable you use. So if you have a higher ratio of pigment to base or whatever the substrate is, it may take more time uh, and or energy for it to change, just because it has uh, a, a deeper density of pigment to change. Um, think about your base. So if you're using a pigment, um, what are you going to mix it with? That's also going to, check, to affect how long it takes, uh, or the, the transformation time, how long it takes for it to change. So for example, if you just use like um, screen print base, it may take a little longer than like white acrylic. Um, I found the, the in general, the, um, the sort of most um, uh, immediate change comes from using white acrylic and blue pigment for whatever reason. Um, and you can also remember combine different, uh, different colors to create different effects. So on uh, the, with the, the heating element has the red, the red pigment uh, and base. As you can see, when heat is applied, it just changes back to the color of the fabric. Right, the pigment disappears, it doesn't go to white, it just, that's the color of the fabric. Uh, but then on the other image, you can see I've mixed red thermochromic pigment with yellow paint to create an orange. And then when heat is applied, the, pig, the red pigment disappears, leaving only the yellow in its place. Um, okay, so next is the substrate. So what material are you going to actually apply it to? Um, are you going to apply it to tracing paper, which is quite thin and will react really quickly because it's going to be in more contact with the heating element? Or if you have something like a thick piece of canvas, it's not going to change because the heat is not is going to take more time uh, and probably won't uh, as efficiently get through that canvas to react with the actual pigment. Um, the, oops, the application, so how you apply it will also determine the uniformity of how it changes. So if you apply it with a silk screen, you're gonna have a much more uniform change than you would if you have a paintbrush. Uh, the room temperature, or sort of like just the ambient temperature, is going to impact um, how quickly your pigment changes. So in the summertime, for example, if you are trying to exhibit uh, a project in the dead of summer in an outside exhibition, for example, uh, with thermochromic ink, you might have problems getting that same reaction um, and quick transformation time that you might have had if you were showing this project in, um, in winter time or in, in a more temperature uh, air condition setting. Uh, and lastly, the conductive material that you use is also going to impact um, the transformation time and how your project looks. So you actually, for these projects, you want to have um, a conductive material, a heating element that has a little bit of resistance. Um, so it needs to just have the right amount. We don't want to use copper tape because it doesn't have enough resistance. And so that current will just go right, right straight through it. Uh, and it won't generate enough heat to cause any change. Um, the Carl Grimm material, the Carl Grimm thread works quite well, and also stainless steel works very well um, as a heating element. And some conductive fabrics will also work well, but you'll just have to test those. So here are just different examples of heating elements. So the Carl Grimm conductive thread that I mentioned before, uh, that works well, but you want to make sure that you have enough of it to, to have a, a good amount of resistance. Um, you need at least 2.5 ohms, uh, I have found in my own tests. Um, again, stainless steel works well. Um, generally, somewhere in the realm of about, you know, 2.5 to 12 ohms for the type of power sources that we're working with. Um, and then another material that we'll talk about in a little while called flexinol is also a really good heating element. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much depth. You, if you want to work with thermochromic ink, you should definitely revisit this worksheet. It will help you figure out what power source you need. Um, but here are some different, uh, different examples of how you can calculate, um, calculate the current you need uh, and then the power source that you should use. So basically, you have a certain amount of, um, 
of energy that you can use in your power source, and that will help determine uh, how long your heating element should be and the amount of resistance that it needs to have. Um, for the circuit, so basically a heating element takes a lot of power. We need a lot of energy to be able to, to heat up that element and then transform that pigment. And so there's a specific type of component that we use uh, and a circuit that we use that's a high load power circuit. Um, so since Arduino cannot, the pins can't provide enough current, remember we can only draw about 40 milliamps. And just if you even glanced at this, uh, at this last slide, we need, you know, roughly 500 milliamps to about an amp to, to, to actually cause that transformation. Um, so we need to have a secondary power source. So we're gonna use a transistor that's an N-channel MOSFET. And I like to use this one, this FQP30N06L uh, MOSFET. Um, so this MOSFET, uh, we are going to use this uh, transistor as a switch. So the way that this particular one works um, is that when we apply a small amount of voltage to the gate, uh, which is the G pin over to the left, um, then the current can flow between the drain and the source. So we use the gate as a switch. So again, the way that this works is we apply a small amount of voltage through the Arduino, as you can see in that sort of teal arrow. When we do that, then we basically lift a little latch and we allow uh, current to flow between the source and the drain. Um, a few examples, so uh, Maggie Orth, um, who is a, a, a sort of grand figure in the world of textiles. Her moving target is um, an old example of work with thermochromic inks, this idea of how to create um, sort of animation, animated textiles is, is a consideration that she, that she worked with a lot in her, in her projects. Um, Chromosonic by Edge Tech, they do a ton of work with thermochromic inks. I highly recommend that you check out um, their projects and portfolio. And then also this Wi-Fi tapestry, uh, sort of visualizing different Wi-Fi signals by using thermochromic ink. Um, a few other projects, uh, Chromacodex by Lindsay Calder also. Um, so sort of this idea of transforming a garment, the color of a garment over time using thermochromic inks. Uh, also dynamic skin sort of plays around with um, visual, making visible processes in the body. Uh, so hidden processes, like revealing them using thermochromic ink. Um, and then, uh, again, back to this idea of animating textiles um, with uh, these crocheted pieces by Lara Devendorf and her team. Um, before I move on to questions, I will say one thing that maybe um, I didn't touch on uh, specifically when we were going through this idea of transformation of thermochromic inks is that it, so it takes time for the ink to change color, to disappear. It also takes time for that heating element to get cool again. So time is a really, really, really important component of thermochromic inks. Um, you can't sort of expect this immediate transformation in one direction and then a transformation in the other direction immediately back. So it's always good to keep in mind uh, as you are working with these materials. And with that, I'll stop to ask if there are any questions so far around visual. So thermochromics, neopixels, or LEDs. Going once. Going twice. OK. Uh, there'll be more time for questions later, but we do have a lot to cover, so I'll just keep going. So next is sound. Um, so I'm going to show you an example of, we're going to talk mainly about uh, fabric speakers. So I'll show you a video of what this looks like. So as you watch this, uh, look at the different um, variables. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead. Oops, skip ahead a little bit. So, and then 
and so does this. Okay, so I want to emphasize that through all of those examples, all of that sound came from the fabric. There is no speaker that was anywhere else uh, that anything was connected to. Um, the speaker was uh, these magnets, the conductive thread, and the fabric. So we'll talk a little bit about what sound is um, and how to actually make these speakers. So if we think about sound, sound is basically just a type of energy made when something vibrates, whether a voice, uh, a wave in nature, or a drum, something, a surface that we hit. So uh, when we think about sound, so if you hit a drum or sort of any other object, it causes air particles around it to vibrate. And then the air will carry this energy in all direction in the form of sound waves. And then when these waves reach your ear, uh, the, these vibrating particles, it causes the hair in your ears to vibrate, which the brain reads as sound. Um, so when we look at a speaker, if you were to take, you know, a basic hobby speaker and break it apart, this is basically what you would find, or any speaker in, you know, a loudspeaker that you would see uh, at a show or on a home stereo system. So you have um, a coil that sends, that contains electrical signals. That's like how you, um, how you send signals to create sound. Uh, that coil is wrapped around a very strong magnet. And then there is a cone that vibrates to make sound, a membrane, right? So it's just coil, magnet, membrane. That's all a speaker really is. And the way, the reason that a speaker works is because this coil makes the magnet vibrate because it becomes a, an electromagnet. Um, so speakers use this property of electromagnetism in order to work. Um, so you may have seen in like early experiments when you were in primary school or middle school, um, you would create an electromagnet by wrapping wire around a nail. Um, and so basically whenever uh, magnetism and electricity are connected because whenever you run current through a wire or any sort of trace, it generates a very small magnetic field. You can amplify that magnetic field um, by having uh, more more wire by um, by creating a coil for a greater field to um, for a stronger field to emerge. So the way that this translates to speakers is basically when you have a stable magnet that we all know uh, a magnet has magnetic fields, uh, positive and negative. So as you create, as you turn this basically like you turn this electromagnet on and off with different audio signals and that changes the um that changes the polarity of the field uh and then that reacts to the stable magnet either attracting or repelling moving back and forth so it makes this cone or this membrane move back and forth um causing uh the air around it to vibrate and again that's what our brains interpret as sound uh, a few different examples of paper speakers, fabric speakers, um, knit speakers, woven speakers, and embroidered speakers here. Uh, when you're starting to think about how you might want to create speakers, so again, uh, so, so there are different variables that you need to think through. So we can use paper or fabric as sort of this cone, this membrane, and instead of using coil, uh, or sorry, instead of using wire, we can um, we can use wire or conductive thread or any other sort of uh, conductive material to generate um, to, to serve as the coil, and then we can put a magnet underneath. Um, so if you're going to create your own, you want to think about coil tightness. So the tighter the coil that you create, the louder the speaker is going to be because the magnetic field will be stronger and will be able to repel against uh, the the stable magnet. Uh, material, the different material that you use um, is how stiff or thick it is. That's going to also determine how loud it's going to be. Um, and again, uh, we don't create these speakers to be hyper efficient, right? 
um, we create them for, uh, for a different type of interaction. So if you're looking to get a really efficient speaker, then you should just use a hobby speaker or another, um, you know, different manufacturer type of speaker. Uh, the size of the magnet is also probably one of the, the biggest, uh, causes the biggest impact for, for volume. So if you have a very strong magnet, it will be much louder because the magnetic field will be louder, uh, will be stronger. Um, uh, also, we use neodymium magnets, but please be aware that these are quite strong speak, quite strong magnets, so you want to be careful around them. Uh, and then the mag magnet placement. So if the magnet is, uh, you know, how close it is to the coil and then how uh, its proximity to the center of the coil also impacts how uh, the volume. So um, in order to make a coil, to make your speaker, you want to basically create a coil. Uh, it doesn't have to be a circle. It can be any sort of shape that you want. Um, the most important thing is that you need to have uh, one end, you need to have access to one end of the, to either end of the coil, right? So you may want to, if you're going to sew it, you want to have um, a sort of, from the back end of things, you want to have um, a piece of that thread coming off so you can attach it to an alligator clip later, uh, as you can see in the top two, uh, top two diagrams, and then a piece of the other end that you sew coming out. So again, I'm not going to go too in depth on how to how to make the coils. Um, you can either sew it, you can uh, weave it um, based on the images that you saw earlier. You can vinyl cut it, you can uh, laser cut it. There are lots of different ways to actually make the coil. The most important thing is that you create this coil in whatever shape you want and the traces of the coil are not touching because you want to create that resistance. You want to create that length. Um, okay. There are a couple of different ways that you can generate sound. Uh, you can do it using the ATtiny or the Arduino, and you can use uh, a transistor because you're going to need a secondary power source. Um, you can use a transistor like the TIP120, or you can use the MOSFET that we discussed earlier uh, to, um, to help amplify that sound. Uh, another way that you, this is probably the easiest way and my favorite way to work with papers, to work with these speakers, is to get a, a mono amp from Adafruit. Um, and then you can basically create this really nice sort of plug and play scenario where you just get a, a headphone jack that you can, if you have an old pair of iPhone speakers, uh, iPhone speakers, if you have an old pair of headphones, you can just cut them up and plug them in. Um, though it may require a little bit of Googling to figure out which wires go where get a battery, uh, and then two alligator clips. Uh, and it's a really great way to just quickly test speakers. Um, and if you follow that link right here, there's a tutorial on my own site about how to construct these. Um, another way that you can uh, generate sound is through this uh, small component and cheap component actually called the DF Player Mini. Um, this is really great if you want to, uh, if you don't want to be tethered to an iPhone or another larger device, um, and if you want to play uh, long audio files, right, because uh, you can play it from it. It requires an SD card to be able to play. Yeah. I um, used it, uh, you saw that just yeah. before you. Sorry? Did someone have a question? No? Okay. Um, well, we'll stop for questions in a second, just in case. Uh, right, so DF Player Mini um, is a really good solution, and there I would recommend if you use the DF Player Mini. They say there are li there are libraries out there. Um, they don't really work. No, but for well. Televerse, ça marche. C'est pour envoyer la découpe. Oh, I think somebody has their volume. Fabrica. Somebody have their volume on? Oh, I mean, it it? okay. Um, I highly recommend using just uh, working with this using commands. Uh, a ah, few cool. different projects. Mais Jeanne a dit que super, uh, magnifique. I think ça. somebody is uh -huh. still not muted. Yeah, c'est bien. Uh, alors, la, la grande là a été chez vous. Elle a dit, ah non, c'est trop cool, trop cool, trop cool. Ah. Hein? Can everybody make sure that their non, mics are muted, please? Vous voulez faire un workshop? Vous n'avez pas trop sur quoi? Um, your microphone, your microphone is, is off. 
Okay. Um, uh, so here are a few different projects that you can check out that use fabric speakers if you're interested. I highly recommend Claire Williams' uh, sound embroidery just because she sort of used magnets as a way to play with the sound, these like sort of circular spherical magnets. Um, okay, so any questions about sound? I know that went really, really fast, but again, you can go back through these slides and check it out. Yes? Hello, I got a question. Yes. Um, I can implement something with um, MIDI technology. I got some, some experience with MIDI, with musical instrument digital interface. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, would you recommend to use it like um, um, Bluetooth communication, or it's better to do it by cable or by Wi-Fi maybe? I mean, that depends on this, like what, what the what setting and environment your project will be for right like and how much delay is acceptable for you so if you if you want to create an interface that has um no significant lag or delay definitely use a cable um again depending on your wi-fi scenario and how reliable that is um you'll probably want to use that over bluetooth um and and if you if the interface needs to be disconnected um, over it, yeah, like depending on like how far you want your interface to be from the actual speaker, uh, would also determine whether Wi Fi or Bluetooth would be better. Um, but I mean, I would say for those types of projects, uh, because you probably want to have things happening in real time, uh, a cable just hardwired in is the best. Is that helpful? Yeah, thanks. But my question was, um, um, I heard that in the past they were using um, Bluetooth as a as a means to communicate, but basically with a computer, with a device to communicate with a computer. Um, but now they're not they're not using it anymore. I don't know if it's a technological problem or something. But they were I try I tried once and it was working like like a charm like that. Yeah, I mean Bluetooth is like a that's a whole other conversation to get into like it depends on the type of bluetooth like are you using sort of like the older bluetooth that just requires like serial communication over like wireless uh or are you talking about bluetooth le um the le which is like sort of a different beast um and it just depends on what the project is and what you're trying to accomplish so sometimes it can work like a charm and sometimes not so much Depends also on the interferences of the of the environment. I mean, on the different on the say that one more time. Oh, oh sorry, you cut out. Yeah, um, what I what I'm saying is that um, maybe it depends on on the interferences of the other signals and the, the neighbor. Maybe you have a lot of Bluetooth uh, other devices working at the same time and uh, something like yeah. that. Definitely. Yeah, um, yeah. No, that's a whole really exciting other, other, uh, that, that would require its own totally separate class and workshop even. It's a lot to get into. But yeah, I highly recommend researching it on your own. Any other questions? Just for time's sake, I want to make sure we, we get everything in. There's still more to go. Mm -hmm. Going once, going twice. Okay, let's get into motion. So we're gonna talk about three different ways that you can uh, tackle motion. So the first is, and we're not gonna specifically talk about uh, the traditional motors that you may see in physical computing projects like servos um, or DC motors. We're gonna talk about um, a few other motors that are a little bit more uh, appropriate for wearable applications. So the first is uh, shape memory alloy or SMAs. The second is flip dots uh, and then vibration motors, haptics. So first we're gonna talk about SMAs. Um, so I'm gonna show you a quick video so you can see how these work in action.
So this video is using a basic blink sketch. Also, that banging has nothing to do with what's going on. There's SMAs are soundless. That's just New York City's heating system. Okay, and this video is showing uh, what is called trained uh, a trained SMA. Let me go back a little bit. So we're decreasing the delay on the blink sketch of the Arduino. You can see it's folding up quite nicely. Okay, so again, that's trained. Now uh, we'll see untrained. So the other video was using a blink sketch, just a digital write delay, uh, and then this is using analog write. And this is it turned on fully. You can see there's a pretty big reaction. Okay. So let's talk about how what we just saw works. Um, so again, shape memory alloys, SMAs, uh, these are metals that change state when they're heated to a certain temperature. Um, so when they're cool, they behave like regular metals, uh, but then they return to a preset shape when heated. Um, and so you can you know, take a deep internet dive to, to research more about sort of the, um, the chemical composition of these and how they're impacted by heat. Um, we won't talk too much about that here though, but they basically just go through these different stages. Um, there are, I meant, I said the words trained and untrained. So uh, you can get untrained flexanol that's basically like a straight wire. You can also get these wires in different diameters, um, but we'll, we'll talk about why or the, the trade-offs of different diameters in a moment. Um, so untrained flexanol and trained flexanol also, they contract by 10% of their length when you run current through them or when heat is applied. Uh, but trained flexanol, untrained flexanol is just straight. Trained flexanol, however, uh, it also contracts by 10%, but it has been trained into a shape through a heating process. So when it's heated, uh, it will return to the shape that you trained it to, basically. So here you can see um, our, is a trained, on the, on the right, is a trained coil from Dynaloy. Uh, a company that, that makes flexanol. And you can pull it apart. And basically, when you, um, if you, you can pull it completely straight. And then when you run current through it, it will uh, smush back up into this tight coil. Um, and you can expand it and embed it in fabric in different sorts of ways. Uh, so a few variables that are really important to consider when you're working with SMAs. So the materials of the substrate. So what are you going to embed it in? Um, and how you're going to embed it in into into that. So generally, um, you know, one of the nice things about SMAs is you get movement without sort of uh, you know the jerky motion and sound of something like a servo motor. Um, but you are not going to get as much pull. You're not going to have as so much strength. So working with lighter weight paper or fabric gets uh, really good uh, really good results. Um, and also working with uh, more natural fabrics like cotton, not polyester, because it could potentially burn because you are just like uh, not, you know, burn the fabric completely, but just cause it to um, get burn marks because uh, because you're talking about higher levels of current. Um, the diameter of the of the wire is also really important to consider. So here we're working. I usually tend to work with 0.008 inch diameter. Um, just because it doesn't 
it, you get you still get a, a a pretty good amount of strength without um, having too much power because the higher the diameter, the, the greater the thickness of the wire, the more power you're going to need to, to actually make it contract uh, or to change state. And then uh, the length is also important to consider because again, as we talked about in the last session, the resistance of um, any conductive material increases as the length increases. So a few different examples we um, when you're talking about uh, like actually embedding it, if you're working with untrained flexanol, you can use different paper engineering techniques um, in order to sort of uh, make larger um, make larger behaviors happen. Uh, G key has some really great examples of this that I am now actually not sure. I don't think are in these slides. Um, another really nice example with fabric is from. Uh, Kobakant, I'll just show this quick video. So they use SMAs to create a really, really lovely um, bleeding effect. So as you can see, there are many links to the documentation around how they did this. You can sort of see a moment at the back. Okay, so lots of different ways to embed into, um, into the fabric. Uh, a really important thing to remember is that you cannot solder directly onto the flexinol, onto the SMA, because it has a layer of oxidation. So a really nice workaround for this is to use crimp beads. Uh, crimp beads are like those little beads that you use in jewelry making. Um, they're very, very, very tiny. And if you just pass uh, the wire through the crimp bead and use pliers to press it down until you can't pull it out, and then you can solder onto the crimp beads. That's a nice little hack. And crimp beads in general are actually quite nice little tools. You can solder them to LEDs, for example, to make them solvable. No, um, um, is the or dynamic? Uh, I think somebody's sound is back on. Can everybody make sure they're muted, please? Yes, it's always the Okay, so you can use the same, the same yeah. circuit that we use to control thermochromic inks we use for SMEs. Um, because again, it's a it's a high load um, high load circuit, so we need to use an external power source. Um, you can uh, use uh, the analog light function. This is currently looking to determine determine if the, uh, there is an active machine. Can everybody make sure they're muted, please? Hello. Wait, thank you. Oh. Sounds like somebody's still not muted. Can you please mute? Can everybody please make sure your mics are muted? By, by when do you need the pieces? Tonight. And yeah, tomorrow I could do. <laughs> what time tomorrow? Uh, uh, before the evening. Oh, yeah. Is it possible to go to mute? So I can relax. Great. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, Okay, so this is again the same circuit that we saw with thermochromic inks. Um, so on the right side, you are using the Arduino or the ATtiny, if you like, or any other microcontroller um, to control uh, uh, how much power you're letting through for the second power source. And then the heating elements are connected at the bottom. Um, so here you want to take a look at the data sheet of this is the data sheet for the dynaloy smas um, and so you can use this information to uh, calculate the power source similar in the way that we did to the thermochromic ink so again i like to use the 0 0.008 inch diameter um, so we know that it has a resistance of 0.8 ohms per inch um, and that uh, we need to work uh, in a range of about 610 milliamps. Um, we can also see that the contraction time takes about one second um, and that the off time is about 2.2 seconds. We're just going to assume that we have a nine volt battery for now, which is generally the best um, uh, 
uh, it works best to have a nine volt battery as opposed to, or a larger um, milliamp hour um, LiPo battery. Um, it, it's really important to remember, again, like you want to work with these materials, um, that the more power you give, it doesn't, um, uh, it's not the, the more power that makes the, the movement more dramatic, it's actually how you embed it in the fabric or in the, um, in the paper or whatever substrate you're using. You always want to make sure to give this material time to breathe and relax. Um, the more relaxed that it is after one contraction, then the next contraction will be more dramatic, right? Um, and there's sort of like an exponential uh, behavior that happens that, you know, if it's already curved up a little bit, um, it's just going to um, keep, uh, the next contraction will keep it um, curving at, from that point. So a few projects that I'll show briefly. So this kinetic scorpion dress from Excess Labs from Joanna Berzowska. You can see a lot of circuitry required to generate a fairly small movement. Okay. And then next is input output paper from G, from G key. So she is using untrained flexinol, um, but she again has sort of implemented these tactics of paper engineering um, to create really strong leverage points for folding. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Um, Aphrodite Pissarra also uh, uses or used SMAs in a uh, a project called the Culture Series, um, where she has these sort of um, layers of uh, sort of this um, rough layer of textiles on the arms that 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 will move uh, using thermochromic ink. Sorry, thermochromic ink using SMAs. Sorry, y'all. This is a it's sort of a marathon to get through all this material, so I don't mean to misspeak. Um, but you can see the coil here of SMAs uh, that as she heats it up contracts and it allows um, sort of this arm piece to move in a really nice way. So if you're interested in working with shape memory alloys, you can check out these projects through the links and see all the documentation and more videos around it. Um, and she also does a great job of creating tutorials around her projects, if you're interested. Uh, so next uh, for motion, Wait, she's flipped off. I have a question. So, sorry, there was a question. Yes, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, uh, I'm, I would like to know if I'm using thick material, like for example, leather, mm -hmm. uh, how can I use uh, SMAs? Will I require like um, more power, obviously, to pull the, the heavy material? So maybe I, I need wider, based on the material yeah. that I want to use for so with leather, um, so it depends on, again, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I would say use the trained and maybe use the trained SMA and maybe go up a higher level diameter and then you will need more power. But for example, this uh, project by Aphrodite uses a much thicker material. I don't know if it's leather specifically, um, but she was able to accomplish a fairly significant amount of movement. Uh, using, I think it was 0 0.01 inch diameter uh, flexinol. So, uh, uh, and just based on like the shape and how she embedded it. It's really, the, the trick with these SMAs is about how you embed them um, and based on the type of movement that you want, um, just sort of playing around with the material and how it moves uh, and different points of movement to generate, to generate that type of behavior. So it's just, it requires a little bit of playing around and testing different materials. Does that answer your question? Yes, to, thank you. Uh -huh. um, and if, you, if anybody has any more like very specific materials and has like sort of a scenario of what they are trying to accomplish, I'm happy to sort of look, look through that and help you figure out a solution um, to the best of my ability. So now we'll go into flip dots. 
Um, I know we, I'm gonna probably start moving a little bit faster now because we still have a uh, motion to cover and then AT Tinies. Um, so my apologies if we go a little bit quickly because I know we need to uh, end fairly soon. So, um, I'll show you what these look like. Okay, and then so that was a flip. That was uh, the flip dot moving back and forth. And now these are those numbers at the top of each one are the number of times the coil uh, the coil was wound underneath, which will make more sense in a, in a moment. Notice also how with the last video, I didn't have to move the alligator clips around, um, but with this one I do in order to make the dot move. And that one is barely moving. You can't tell. Pretty much not moving at all. Okay, so flip dots. Um, flip dots are actually like a really great, great way to just understand how motors work. Again, going back to this idea of electromagnetism, um, uh, using those properties to create movement. So what we have is a magnetic bead, a hematite bead. Um, if you decide you want to work with flip dots uh, and you go on a hunt for these hematite beads, please make sure you get the ones that are magnetic. If you get the ones that are not magnetic, it will not work. Um, so if you have this magnetic bead that's flipping back and forth when you run current through the coil, similar thing to what's happening with the speaker. You have a stable magnet and then you have an, elect an electromagnet that is changing in polarity based on um, the direction of the current. So it creates an electromagnetic field that will attract or repel the bead based on the direction of the current. So here is a, a, a diagram that explains this a little bit more in depth. Um, again, just for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go into this too much, but if you're interested in electromagnetism in general, um, and specifically working with flip dots, this uh, will be helpful to go, to go back to. So again, sort of, um, if the current is moving in one direction, uh, it'll generate a field in one direction, versus if you're moving current in the other direction, the electromagnetic field will move in the opposite direction and will change uh, the state of the bead. Um, okay, so how it works. So uh, if we're working with only one coil, so this is um, working with uh, very thin, uh, very thin gauge wire and just wrapping it into a coil. I'll show a few slides on how to make it in a second. But basically we have a coil and we have our bead. Um, it's also helpful to sort of like paint one side of your bead just to know uh, how it's oriented. Um, and then we switch between the positive and negative terminals of the battery to make mo uh, movement happen. Um, or you can put two coils, one on top of the other, so you can flip back and forth. Uh, a few variables uh, for good measure. So uh, the bead size is something that you need to consider. So the bigger the magnet, the larger the field needs to be to flip it. The, the, most, the most difficult and challenging thing about working with flip dots is how you secure the bead. This just requires a lot of testing depending on the size of your coil and the size of your bead and how you're embedding it, but basically how you sew the bead in, you wanna make sure that the tension is not too tight so it doesn't, uh, it, to make sure it will still flip, uh, but it can't be too loose or else it'll pop out of the coil. So this takes a little bit of finessing. Uh, the number of coils, so you should have at least 50 coils. The gauge of wire, so I was working with uh, a smaller gauge wire that was about 36, 
um, so you can get more coils in. Uh, and if you have a larger gauge, then you have less coils but more density of wire. Um, so it just depends. You can play around with that. And then the coil wrapping material, so how you are going to embed the coil. So here you can see in this slide I used embroidery floss to embed it. You can also, um, I think I have a few images maybe later where I have crocheted around it. So you want to make sure that um, you're creating a uniform smooth surface, that there's not a lot of friction um, to help the, the, the bead um, flip smoothly. Um, so when you make it, again, this is sort of the diagram, you have your hematite bead, you have cotton thread that is what I use to embed it into the coil. Um, you have conductive fabric uh, and the enamel wire that's soldered to the conductive fabric and the conductive fabric is just to act as a pad to attach your power to. Um, so first you want to create your coil, wrap it between 50 and 100 times. I find the end of a Sharpie works quite well for um, the size of the hematite beads that I like. You want to make sure to leave about two to five inches on either end just so you can solder it to a pad. Um, the other sort of tricky part is uh, when you take the coil off, you want to wrap uh, one, one side of the coil around just to make sure that you have a nice circular coil. Um, next is you want to burn off the enamel at the ends. Uh, so you can do that either through using a lighter, just holding like a cigarette lighter at the end, or you can uh, just run um, solder over it until the solder starts to stick. This might take a little while and just uh, make sure that you have a, that you have a connection with a multimeter. Uh, next is that you want to embroider it in or uh, crochet it in. Um, you can do this and then uh, adhere it to the fabric, sew it into, sew it into um, whatever fabric substrate you're using. Uh, and then you want to solder two wires to the fabric pads. Again, this is just to help uh, create a strong connection with your alligator clips or your power source. Um, and then you're going to want to sew the hematite bead into the loop. Again, this is the tricky part and we'll just take a little bit of finessing to figure out. Uh, and then you want to test it uh, using a 9 volt battery or a lipo battery. And here is the one bit textile swatch. Um, as far as I know, this is the first one, um, uh, flip dot that I've ever seen made by Irene Posh and Ibu Kerbach. Uh, this is the first test, test swatch for a much larger, much more ambitious project that I'll show you in a second. Um, so you can also apply this idea to create movement in other ways, such as the flapping wing. Um, you can see a coil and then there's a magnet underneath that repels. Uh, and then also another small motor that uses magnets and a coil and a diode. Okay. So you can yeah, apply these ideas in many different ways. Uh, some projects that you can use for inspiration, so the flip dot dress, which doesn't exactly, uh, it, this is a much more um, highly fabricated, uh, less DIY way of integrating flip dots. Uh, and next is Crafted Logic. So these are so Crafted Logic is a project that's leading up to uh, the embroidered computer, which is a, a beautiful project where you have all of these different flip dots that are serving as vehicles of memory to create an actual computer. I forget how many bits it is, um, but it can store memory um, by each of these flip dots act acting as switches. I highly encourage you to check out this project. Um, okay, so that's all on flip dots. Again, um, there are going to be links uh, in this um, in the uh, the documentation um, that you can go look at how to sort of create circuits that will allow you to control flip dots with Arduino and all that kind of good stuff. If you're interested in doing a project around that, so next are vibration motors. Um, so everybody is probably familiar with vibration motors. Uh, they are used for haptics in all sorts of applications. Um, and if you want to use them in your wearable projects, that's great. Uh, they're really, really nice and useful. So a few specs, um, they draw about two to five volts. Um, uh, 
uh, and they also, depending on their voltage, will draw out different amounts of current, which comes into consideration when we're developing our circuits for them. Um, so there are two different, actually two different types of vibration motors. There are ERM motors and then LRA motors. Um, you will probably be using the ERM motors. Uh, just, it's helpful if you decide to take a deep dive into vibration motors. Uh, you should use a transistor to control your motor with your Arduino so you don't damage it. Um, here is the circuit if you want to connect it to an Arduino, or you can also connect it to a 3-volt battery if you don't want, and just like make a switch in between uh, if you don't want to go in-depth with Arduino. Uh, there are also breakout boards that you can use to drive the behavior of a vibration motor more precisely. Just keep in mind that it, can, it scales exponentially pretty quickly because you need one, um, one board per motor. Um, this is from research that I did about six months ago. They may have come out with another board that allows you to drive more motors off of one board. Um, but you know, if you want to have like fading effects coming from, uh, for your motor, you would need one of these boards to be able to create that. Uh, and then for the code, you just use uh, you can use digital rights to turn the motor on and off, or analog right to control the speed of your of the vibration. So pretty simple stuff. Um, and then a few different projects that use vibration motors. So the Hug Shirt by Cute Circuit is like a really standard um, wearable example. Um, wow, look at that cell phone. Uh, where you can use, um, basically you can record and send a hug using vibration motors um, across long distances. Uh, and then Rachel Frere and Sophia Bruckner also created a project called the Embody Suit that uses vibration motors to send, uh, rem uh, to, to give the feeling of presence by sending remote, by, to create the feeling of presence through vibration motors um, through remote data from a distance. Um, other projects, so there are yoga pants now that are embedded with vibration motors that will tell you when you're doing a position correctly. Um, and then uh, this project called Tactile Dialogues that uses um, vibration motors to, um, uh, to communicate different messages. Uh, okay, any questions before we move out of actuators into AT Tinies? And with that, Nat, actually, I have a question of how we're doing on time, if you are there. All right, I'll assume I'm doing OK on time and that there are no questions. OK, cool. All right, so now we move on to the AT Tiny out of the actuator space and back into the microcontroller space. So the AT Tiny, why would we use it? What is it? So the AT Tiny is basically a very small Arduino. It doesn't have as many capabilities uh, as the Arduino, but for very simple projects, it works very well and it's quite cheap. Um, so uh, as we talked about in the last class, different uh, computers, sort of different chips uh, and boards are good at doing different things. Um, and so here we have the Arduino that has a certain amount of memory um, and a certain number of pins, all of these different properties. Uh, and we can use it to do different things, um, control different outputs through different inputs, but it has a distinct form factor that's quite large. Uh, it's also a little bit expensive. Um, and sometimes we don't need all of those, uh, all of that functionality. So we can use AT Tiny um, if it's a small project. So we have uh, the AT Tiny 45 or 85 uh, that has five usable pins. It has three analog input pins and two pulse width modulation pins. Remember, those are pins that we need for things like fading an LED. Uh, and then there is the AT Tiny 44 and 84 that has 11 pins, which is great. It has eight analog input pins, which is crazy, uh, and four pulse width modulation pins. So as you can see, it's not a ton of memory, but it's fine for small projects. Um, something to keep in mind is that if you want to use this with uh, different uh, sensors, um, uh, like a, um, 
Uh, my mind is blinking, but if you want to use this with like a prefabricated sensor component from like SparkFun or Adafruit or another company, just make sure that there is documentation. Always, always make sure that there's documentation around how to connect the ATtiny to any sort of outside component, um, because you know you do have some folks who have done a lot of work uh, building out libraries for the ATtiny, but then you know you don't want to buy a sensor and then realize that there is no documentation for how to connect it to one of these. Um, one of these little boards. So a few different examples of projects that use the AT Tiny uh, in this space. Um, you can see you can get the, the much even smaller version, the SMD version of the AT Tiny. Uh, you can use it to control um, use it to control a fabric speaker. You can use it to gather sensor input and data. Um, and in one of uh, my favorite projects, the AT Tiny POV by Mika Satomi, uh, uses AT Tiny and Charlie Plexing to create um, a persistence of vision project. Okay, so how to program the AT Tiny? So we're going to be looking at the AT Tiny 45 and 85. Uh, there's generally like more documentation out there around uh, this particular AT Tiny. This is the pinout of the AT Tiny uh, 45 or 85. The only difference is how much memory they can store. Um, one thing uh, about, uh, for those of you who haven't done a lot of work with electronics and microcontrollers, um, every microcontroller has what's called a pinout. And a pinout is basically a diagram that shows you what each of the pins does. So it takes this, um, it maps the actual physical pin or the electrical connector and tells you what its function is. Um, so here you can see the pinout of the AT Tiny. Um, so you have on the inside of the AT Tiny this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So those numbers reference the the contacts, right? Those don't actually tell you the functionality. So just because it says two here, it doesn't mean that that is pin two on the Arduino. For that, we need to go outside of the diagram, and we see here that if we want to use analog input, oops, analog input three, we can access that through this pin, uh, or we can use um, digital pin three. Same here, analog uh, input two or digital pin four, um, and then same over here. And then we have reset, ground, and five volts. So every board has a pinout. If you, you know, you can go Google the Arduino pinout and see all the different functionality there. This is actually a basic functionality of the AT Tiny pinout. There are even more um, functionality for some of the other pins that you can look up if you're interested in. Um, there are two ways to program an AT Tiny. As you can see, it's you know it doesn't have a breakout board. It's just that one chip. You can't just sort of plug it into your computer. You need something extra. So you can program it using your Arduino or using an AVR programmer. Um, I highly recommend using the programmer and not doing it through your Arduino, though that's the cheaper way to do it. There's just a lot more involved programming it through the Arduino, but it's it's not super difficult. Um, this is just a set of steps that will tell you how to uh, actually program it. Again, if you're interested in working with the AT Tiny, um, go back and look at these slides. There are lots of tutorials around how to program it on Google as well. The main thing that I want to highlight here is that um, uh, if you want to, so uh, two things, if you want to do something like give the AT Tiny superpowers that will allow you to um, uh, read serial data, uh, which we'll talk about in a second how to do that, uh, you need to do something called burning the bootloader to make sure the clock is at eight megahertz. Uh, and then the next thing is to make sure that all of your settings are configured correctly. So you need to make sure that you have uh, the correct programmer chosen, the correct board chosen, the correct processor, and the correct clock. Um, it's also important to note that it's okay if uh, you don't see the port actually coming in. If it doesn't show up, that's fine uh, if you're working with a tiny programmer. Um, and then you're just going to click upload and that should, you know, you can upload it with the blink sketch, make sure you change it to uh, pin two um, because it doesn't have pin 13 uh, and then click upload. Uh, it's also important to note as you're sort of like going back and forth between, you know, uploading to the AT Tiny or working with an Arduino, you want to always make sure you go back and change the board processor, the board uh, in the tool setting in the port. You won't necessarily need to change the processor for like the Arduino. 
Um, okay, circuits. So uh, to test your AT Tiny, you want to carefully remove it. Uh, I find using really, really tiny needle nose pliers like the ones you use for jewelry making work quite well to pick it up and move it onto a board because uh, you don't want to snap off any of those delicate pins. So then you want to connect it using this diagram. And if you power it up, turn it on, everything, uh, then your LED should start blinking and you know that you've programmed it correctly. So a few different functions that you can use with the AT Tiny that are compatible with Arduino are here. Um, you don't, so the AT Tiny doesn't have the RX TX pins that we use to um, communicate serially uh, with the serial monitor as we do with the Arduino. We can't access those easily, but there are two ways that we can do this. Uh, one is using the Arduino sort of like as a mouthpiece for the serial port. Um, there's an instructable here that you can use. And the other one is by using an FTDI cable. The FTDI cable is like super simple uh, and very easy. It's just a little bit more expensive. And there's a great tutorial around how to do that that's linked here. So for example, this is helpful because if you want to uh, understand the values that are coming in from a sensor and you want to map those, you would need to do that using, you would need to have access to those values through the serial port. Um, okay, a few different examples of circuits that you can use with the AT Tiny. Uh, if you're, you know, still with me, the power through, this is the last big uh, section that we'll do. And then we'll stop and take questions and I'll give you your assignment. So um, this AT Tiny circuit, this is a touch and sensor circuit. This is sort of, if you're interested in using the AT Tiny, this is a great little test circuit to sort of have, have around. Um, so it can, it has a touch sensor. It also has a variable resistor uh, and it can be used as a switch. So here is the circuit. So one thing I should note, uh, you'll see in this diagram, the AT Tiny is sort of that little black box with the white leg sticking out. That little dot at the top, that is to tell you which way to orient the circuit. So it's really important that you make sure that the indentation, uh, the little circle at the top of your AT Tiny is aligned to that white, white little dot. Um, yeah, so you can follow this circuit and create it. You can put it right here. This assumes that you're working with just, you know, a piece of tape, sorry, a piece of paper uh, and copper tape. So it's not necessarily the breadboarded version. Um, you can also use uh, the AT Tiny to make some uh, pretty lovely noise music uh, using the tip 120 and a power source. You can connect a sensor to the AT Tiny and then to a textile speaker or just a regular speaker. Uh, here is a diagram of that circuit if you're interested in creating that. It also has an indicator LED. Um, there's also a, a wonderful sort of ongoing project by Aphrodite Pissarra and Martin DB uh, that's an EMF detector that they um, that came out of a, a workshop and that they've sort of both individually pursued working on. Um, and this is really fun because it allows you to sense uh, electromagnetic fields and to create these really beautiful, intricate, wearable antennas that you can see here. Um, so basically, this is a detector that picks up on um, electromagnetic uh, fields that are outside of our visible, uh, visible spectrum. Um, so you can sort of use it as a way of interacting, for example, uh, with the city in ways that you may have not, you know, sort of sense the fields that are sort of bouncing all around you. Um, so the way that this works is you have a, a transmitter and a transmitting uh, antenna. So that is sort of um, uh, the different fields that are being sort of put out into space. Um, and then you have the receiving antenna and the receiver, so which would be this circuit using the AT Tiny that are taking in the signals um, and, and amplifying it and that will allow us to do something interesting with it, like uh, sonify it. Um, here is the circuit for the Tiny EMF. Um, Aphrodite has a bunch of uh, documentation on her own website around this that uh, I linked to in a previous slide. So this is her diagram. And here are some of the projects that she's used uh, with this, um, this or some of the, uh, the different um, antennas that, that she's created and that Claire Williams has also done a lot of work with knitted antennas with very small gauge wire. Um, 
It's important to note here that these uh, antennas that she has knitted are enamel, uh, have a type of enamel um, insulator on them. So it's not like she's just knitting with bare wire. Um, fractals are another great way uh, of creating antennas. Um, they, they're really good at sort of amplifying and picking up these signals. Um, and they have really, really beautiful patterns that you can use uh, to, um, you know, decorate a garment or sort of uh, use, um, use this pattern as uh, sort of a functional piece on, on the, the garment that you're creating or the wearable that you're creating. And you can, Aphrodite's done a lot of research into sort of the best types of antenna, the best type of fractals uh, that create antennas. Okay, so with that, that's the main part of the presentation. I know it was a lot of information, but I hope that you found something that you liked and were interested in. Uh, and that being said, any questions about the last section or anything we've talked about? going once yeah I think so I think does anybody have questions yeah, yeah we have a question great yeah the question is about the vibration motor mm -hmm. in uh, your circuit you are using um, a transistor mm -hmm. yeah yeah is it necessary the transistor in this case does it, it does, does yeah it Sorry. is best practice. Yeah, y yes. Yeah. But this is a so small motor. And um, uh, you working at a three, let's suppose that you supply the entire circuit at a three volt. Then um, you don't need it. Like if you're working, yeah, if you're working with an Arduino board that is rated for three, for three volts, then you wouldn't need it. This is just working with an Arduino board that's putting out five volts because it only the, you run the risk of damaging your vibration motor if you apply five volts to it. But if you're working at a board that only needs three, then you don't need the transistor and you should be fine. Okay, so that motor doesn't run at five volt. No. Okay, okay, good to know. Thanks. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Nobody? Okay. I, think I know you're, all of your brains are probably like, what is going yeah. on? <laughs> so that's fine. <laughs> like I said in the beginning, this is, I developed this presentation to give like a very broad overview so you can really, you know, understand the tools that are available to you, the materials that are available to you, the processes and approaches, and then you can sort of cherry pick and figure out which ones are most interesting to you. Um, okay, so I will move on to some big takeaways. Uh, so first, so three big takeaways, transistors are fascinating little guys, little components, and they are your friends. Um, if you have a circuit that needs a lot of current and needs an extra power source, you will probably need to work with a transistor. Um, transistors are also the reason why we have modern computing. So, you know, they're pretty cool. Uh, also, this is, you know, maybe the most important thing is just remember to always work with your materials and don't have unrealistic expectations for them. You know, I have a lot of students that I, you know, over the years, they always get so excited around working with Flexinol and Thermochromic ink, and they have these grand ideas for what they want it to do. And then they try and apply those ideas and they're like, I don't understand why it's not working because they had these unrealistic expectations for them. So it's really important to test them, play around with them, see what they can do, and then work within their constraints while also you know, trying to push and see, see how, to, how to reach beyond those limits. Uh, and then also, AT Tinies are really great for, for small projects. So you know, it's one more tool in your, in your toolbox. Okay, so your assignment for next week is to create a swatch using the ATtiny uh, with one input and one output of your choice. 
So I gave you a bunch of different examples of circuits that you can use for the ATtiny. So you can use one of those circuits, uh, or you can go online, do some Googling around, searching, um, and find another circuit that you want to use. Uh, so that's part one of your assignment. And then part two is to create two, actua two actuator swatches using two, uh, two of the techniques that we learned today and then to test them with the Arduino or the ATtiny. Okay, any, any questions about your assignment? We might have a question here in Amsterdam. Yeah. Uh, Go wondering for it. if it will be okay to use actually the inputs that we made uh, in the previous session also for uh, the first swatch. That would be one. wonderful. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Good. I think this mm -hmm. might also help many of the other participants yes. all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> so think about this clearly. So you also have done a lot of amazing things then. And those you can uh, you can implement, so you do not this double, but actually start from uh, the amazing things from last time. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, uh, I think that's it. Um, if you have any specific questions about working with one of the materials or components, um, feel free to email me. Uh, and we can we can work through some of those if you can't figure out the solution. All right, I will stop sharing my screen. Yeah, thank you, Liza. There we so go. Much. Yes, thank Again, you. Again, an amazing presentation. <laughs> and when you were so talking about yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they will be overwhelmed, but uh, one piece at a time. I think yeah, uh, they will they will just make it. And they <laughs> Somehow do. No, when you were saying the AT Tinies are your friends, I remember when you um, came in Barcelona for our first bootcamp. Yes. You were there. And you said like, yeah, I went on my honeymoon with a box full of AT Tinies. And we were all like, okay, this is the first one. You know? <laughs> I think that was, for me and Nat, it stayed like this moment uh, in time. <laughs> I love traveling with electronics. <laughs> Oh, great. Well, right. thank you so much for the amazing lecture. And um, I see still many smiling and some confused faces down there. But <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it will be okay. And yeah, uh, yeah I will stop the recording. Okay.